chapter five, how to make a banana sandwich and other vital life lessons. Day after day, Tom rode east across Europe. The days turned into weeks, the weeks turned into months. He grew stronger and fitter each day. In the morning, the sun was bright on his face as he rode towards it. By the evening, the sun had moved round the sky and was behind him. Tom was pulled forwards by his evening shadow, which stayed in front of him, encouraging him to keep going. He learned a few new words each day to help him to talk to the people he met. He learned to put his tent up quickly without it blowing away. He fixed some punctures and he felt the muscles in his legs growing bigger each day. As well as becoming very fit, Tom realised that he was also hungry all the time. A hungry cyclist. Cycling uses up a lot of energy. He spent a lot of time daydreaming about food. It was in one of those early daydreams that Tom came up with the idea of banana sandwiches. They had lots of energy and they were very cheap. Tom lost count of how many hundreds of banana sandwiches he ate on his ride around the world. Because he did not have much money, Tom always had to eat cheap food. He also liked to try the different foods in the countries he was riding through. But more often than not, it was banana sandwiches in the day, noodles at night. The same thing day after day. This might sound a bit boring, but because he was always hungry, a banana sandwich or three tasted just as delicious as his mum's best cooked dinners. Another way that Tom kept his adventure cheap was by camping at night rather than staying in hotels. Sleeping in his tent was good because it was free and it was good because it was exciting. It was bad because he could not have a shower so he got quite dirty, but Tom didn't care too much about that. Each evening as the sun began to set, Tom would look for a safe, quiet place to sleep. He would find a peaceful wood or a grassy field. Once he stopped to camp, he did the same things every time. First, he would take off his sweaty shoes and socks. He liked the cool, fresh feel of the soft ground on his feet after a hard day's ride. As he could only get clean when he found a river to wash in, his feet were starting to become very smelly. Next, so Tom set up his tent. He had a small green tent. It did not weigh much, but it had enough to space to protect him and all his things from the rain. The first few times he put the tent up, he ended up in a complicated tangle of tent fabric and long poles, but he soon got the hang of it and could now put up the tent, put up the tent in just under five minutes. Once his tent was up, Tom would find a nice log to use as a seat. Then he would cook his supper on his little camping stove. He did the washing up simply by licking his spoon and wiping his pan clean with a piece of bread. He wondered if his mum would let him use this new technique when he returned home. After eating, Tom would write his diary so that even when he was an old man, he would never forget the adventures he had enjoyed that day. There are adventures every day if you know where and how to look for them. So here's Tom's diary entry. Okay, this is about Bulgaria. I'm sitting in my tent in Bulgaria trying to be really quiet. Animals only come out if they don't know I'm here. So far I've seen rabbits, foxes and deer, but the most brilliant was the wild boar in a forest in Hungary. I hope I can see one of those again tonight, if I can stay awake long enough. It's funny, I used to stay up really late to watch my television shows, but now after an exciting day cycling and seeing amazing things, I feel quite happy to sleep. Some nights I can't even be bothered to put up my tent, I'm so exhausted, but I still do of course. I'll carry on towards Turkey tomorrow once I hear the morning birds singing. Tom. My favourite foods. I eat lots of banana sandwiches. Recipe below. But for a treat, I eat food that is popular in each country. Here's what I've tried so far. France. Crepes. Thin pancakes with chocolate and hazelnut spread. Germany. Sausages with curry sauce. Hungary. Goulash stew with beef and pap paprika. Austria. Wiener schnitzel. Fried pork with chips and loads of mayo. Recipe for banana sandwiches. One, peel a banana. Two, put it on a piece of bread. Three, put another piece of bread on top. Four, push down hard on the sandwich to squidge the banana flat and spread it. And five, eat and repeat until full. Okay, now we're going to read chapter six, Tom becomes a caveman. In a town in Germany, it took Tom about an hour of cycling before he managed to wrap his, um, oh, <laughs> wrap his tongue around such a difficult name for it. He had arrived on the banks of the, of the mighty 
Danube River. The Danube is so blue, so bright and blue, is the second longest river in Europe. The longest river is, is the Volga in Russia. The Danube begins in the Black Forest of Germany, the forest famous for its cake, and runs all the way to the Black Sea. It flows for 1,700 miles. Tom was going to ride the length of it. Tom sat munching his fourth banana sandwich of the day and stared at the water sliding by. He felt hypnotised by the wide river. It had been flowing day and night, year after year, for thousands and thousands of years. How amazing! He rode alongside the, the river Danube for weeks, pedalling downstream through Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Serbia, Romania and into Bulgaria, where the Danube ran out into the Black Sea. A few days after leaving Bulgaria, Tom reached Istanbul. Istanbul is the biggest city in Turkey. It is almost the most beautiful city he had seen, he had been to so far. It has been an important city for thousands of years, and some of the most impressive buildings are very, very old. Tom wrote a postcard to his family back home. After looking around Istanbul, taking lots of photos, and treating himself to some delicious food, pide maybe, a Turkish pizza. Tom rode down to the shore of Bosporus. The Bosporus is a narrow strait of water about 700 metres wide, not far from Istanbul. Old men were sitting quietly on little stools holding fishing rods. They didn't seem to be catching many fish, but they didn't seem to mind either. They were happy chatting to their friends and feeling the warm sunshine on their faces. The Bosporus marks the edge of Europe. The rest of Turkey is in Asia. Looking at the big ships sailing by, Tom was delighted to have made it right across Europe. His first continent was behind him. On the other side of the water lay a brand new continent. Even though Tom knew that Europe was the smallest and the easiest continent he would cross on his journey, he still felt proud. He was happy to have made it this far, but he was eager to keep going. New continents awaited him. New friends, new challenges, new adventures. Brilliant. Tom wheeled his bike onto the little ferry for the short ride across the water. Goodbye Europe, hello rest of the world, he shouted on the deck of the ferry into the breeze. A seagull whirled, its, whirled away in surprise at his loud voice, even though Turkish seagulls probably cannot understand English. Riding through Turkey, Tom visited the region of, of Cappadocia. 2,000 years ago, people had begun living in underground cities there. Homes, churches, storerooms, Everything had been carved underground out of rock. People had stored their harvests in caves and kept their sheep and goats in them at night. Even today some people lived in homes of carved into the sides of cliffs. As well as the interesting houses, Cappadocia also has weird, beautiful rock formations known as fairy chimneys that rise up out of the ground. Okay, here is his entry. Turkey. Today I saw a collection of jewel covered swords in the oh, the top the top cafe palace in Istanbul. I almost also walked through the spice market. So many smells and noises and colours. Much better than the supermarket back home. I've seen loads of amazing sights here, like Hagia Sophia, the biggest building in the world one thousand five hundred years ago. Since then it's looked been a church, a mosque, and now it is a museum. And I couldn't believe the blue mosque. It's in one of the most beautiful buildings that I've ever seen, with so many domes and towers. There was a family here in Turkey that lived in a super cool cave house near Cappadocia. It has electricity, a television, and a front door. They invited me to spend the night on a proper bed. I think it was the best sleep I have had so far. My sleeping bag can only cushion me so much, and I had a shower. Since beginning this trip, I've become more observant. I've been learning so much about nature, why trees grow so tall, why the moon changes shape every night, and why rainbows happen. I've also found out a lot of weird and interesting things about all of the cities I cycled through in Europe. I found out that hot dogs were invented in Vienna, Austria, Dracula comes from Romania, and in Bulgaria, nodding your head means no, and shaking it from side to side means yes. The world really is an interesting place once you start to look at it properly. Seven, Salam Alaikum. After Turkey, Tom rode into an area known as the Middle East. 
which consists of several different countries. The language of the Middle East is Arabic. Tom once again began learning new words, but he was faced with an extra difficulty in Arabic. Even the alphabet was totally different. Suddenly, shop fronts looked as though they had been splattered by spaghetti rather than just words. His journey had just become even more difficult. How could all these scribbles be words, Tom thought, hopelessly. He could not even understand the road signs or distance signs because numbers are also written differently in Arabic. Tom had to use his fingers to explain how many bananas he wanted to buy when he pointed to them in the shops. Of course, to the local people, Arabic was easy and normal and they would have found the English language just as funny looking and difficult. Arabic is the fifth most common language on earth, spoken by nearly 250 million people. So Tom thought he'd better start learning. The first thing Tom learned was how to greet people. Salam alaikum. Shepherd boys shouted from the fields. In the morning, the people in the bakeries were where Tom bought delicious flesh, fresh flat bread, so hot he had to juggle it back to his bike. Would smile and say, Salam alaikum. In fact, every single person Tom met would say, Salam alaikum to him. How? Tom now learned how to reply to this greeting, which means, peace be with you. He said, alaikum asalam, which means, and peace to you also. This greeting is used by every Muslim person in the world. A Muslim is someone who follows the religion of Islam. Islam is the second largest religion in the world and the biggest one in the Middle Eastern countries Tom was riding through. Tom was on his way back to Baalbek in Lebanon to see the largest Roman temples in the world. He had also been told about Harj al Bahar, the biggest brick in the world which lay near to the temples. He definitely wanted to see that. The Romans had dreamed of building the ultimate temple using bricks even bigger than a bus. Tom couldn't even imagine how big this temple would have been. However, after carving the first giant brick out of stone in a quarry, the Romans realised that it was just too big. It weighed 12,000 tonnes. So in the end, they only made the first brick. Baalbek was an exciting place. The temples were so well preserved that Tom found it easy to imagine Romans living there almost 2,000 years ago. Six huge columns towered above him. Tom learned that eight more of the original stone columns had been taken down and carried by ship to Istanbul 1,500 years ago. They were used in the building of the Hagia Sophia, which Tom had recently visited. The journey was teaching Tom how the history of so many different countries and cultures are all mixed up together. The historic city of Petra in Jordan was even more astonishing. It took Tom about two weeks to ride there from Baalbek. Petra was another ancient city. Incredible temples and buildings had been carved into the side of cliffs. And although Petra was 2,000 years old, people in Europe did not even know it existed until a Swiss explorer called Johann Ludwig Birdhoff rediscovered it just about 200 years ago. Petra is hidden away down a narrow, winding canyon. Tom pedalled down its winding route for about a mile. The steep rock walls rose up above him on each, both sides, and he could see only a tiny slice of the sky far, far above him. What an unbelievable entry to a city, Tom thought to himself. No wonder it stayed secret for so long. But that was nothing compared to his excitement when he would reach the end of the narrow gorge. Facing him, rising up from the sandy floor, was an enormous building carved out of the cliff known as the Treasury. It was a beautiful red rose colour. Tom's jaw dropped as he stared at it. If people could make something so wonderful 2,000 years ago, then he would definitely ride his bike around the world. He was so inspired to believe he actually could do it. I've got his diary entry here. So, the Middle East. Riding through the Middle East, I have learned a lot about the religion of Islam. Each year there is only one holy month for Muslims called Ramadan. It had just started when I got there. During Ramadan, Muslims are not supposed to eat or drink anything between sunrise and sunset, even water. Muslim people use this month to think extra hard about how to live a better life for Allah, which is their God, and how he would approve. I have tried to follow other cultural traditions while on my journey, but I don't have to follow the rules of Ramadan because one, I'm not a Muslim, and two, I'm on a journey already. Going on long journeys is so hard that you cannot manage without food, so you're left off all the normal rules. In other words, I need my banana sandwiches and water bottle at all times of the day. Next comes the Arabic language. Arabic is extra hard for me because it doesn't use the letters that I'm used to. Plus it's written from right to left. So hello would read Ella. But some of the words I've learned in Arabic, I got someone I met to write the letters out for me. 
I can't do it. I've got a table there of how the words are translated into Arabic from English. I'm not going to try to read those. Okay, even though I normally count numbers out on my fingers, I wanted to learn what numbers look like in Arabic because I found out that's where our own numbers originally came from.